what she's doing. And maybe okay. make you okay. Good. No, it's 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 been started. So, uh, thanks everybody for for showing up for attending for this uh, today's Marine Planning Committee meeting. Uh, ground rules, or we'll follow our our, our typical ground rules um, until public comment. We'll uh, filter any questions through the Marine Planning Committee members. Uh, we we will have a public comment opportunity before lunch if time permits. Also want to highlight that Jessica Watson has taken over the ODFW seat for Delia. Delia, I, I know that we've thrown effusive amounts of praise on you in emails, but I just wanted to say thank you for all that you did have done and all that fun stuff um, helping us out. Susan, do you want to jump in here as well? <laughs> yes, um, Delia, I will never forget the 19 page uh, summary you did of all the comments um, back way back when, when the Marine Planning Committee first got going. I think it was instrumental in getting us moving and uh, focusing our efforts on, um, on some of the letters and stuff. So thank you very much and welcome to Jessica. I have uh, full faith that you will be a valuable uh, member of the Marine Planning Committee. You have big shoes to fill, Jessica. Everyone. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> hey, this is Carrie. Can you hear me? We hear you now. Yes, Carrie. Great. So um, I'm on my second computer, but the main computer I logged in with, which is the moderator computer, is still frozen up. So um, I don't know if I'll be able to share. Um, you know, some of the, the slide shows, um, but I guess we'll deal with that when we get there. I might be able to um, on the fly here, um, but it also means that at least at this point, I can't make you guys moderators. So uh, anyway, I'll keep trying to figure this out, but at least I can talk and you can hear me. I don't know if that's a positive <laughs> or not, but <laughs> here I am. It's a positive. Yeah, I apologize for that. Um, so, Mike, I, I think you covered most of the opening remarks. Remarks. Um, I didn't do uh, roll call. As a reminder, this. Okay, I'll do roll call, and then also as a reminder, um, this meeting is being recorded, and we will post the link to the meeting webpage. Um, and um, yeah, which is what we do with all of our MPC meetings, um, and and then. I have the roster here. I'm just, I usually, I just do the roll call um, by looking at the participants, which I will be happy to do. It looks like we might be missing a few just at a um, first glance, but if it's okay with you chairs, I'll just take roll call silently based on the participants. I think that that's works. Fine with Thanks, me. Gary. And that's weird. I see down at the, if you click on participants um, and it, if you scroll to the bottom, it shows people who have logged in, but then they left. And so I, on my main computer, I'm shown as disconnected. So obviously that's what happened, but at least the meeting's still going. Um, <laughs> you can hear me. So um, can we talk about June 6th for a minute? I think we should. Yes. Okay. We haven't. Yeah, so what's that? We have not yet. Okay. Yeah, so um, I wanted to let everyone know that um, we had booked, we have booked a June 6th Marine Planning Committee meeting that was primarily to um, cover the draft wind energy areas that are pending off of Oregon. And then we also um, were go are going to um, uh, have uh, an hour or two discussion on fishery communications plans. Uh, we've lined up the five uh, provisional lease winners from California to talk about um, those communications plans. And so that will still happen. But um, based on a conversation I had yesterday with Doug Boren, they will not be ready to present any information on the draft WIAs. And um, and it also certainly sounds like the draft wheels will not be released by June 6th. So we're basically going to 
drop that whole part of the June 6th agenda and just go straight to um, straight to a discussion with the uh, provisional lease winners from California and talk about fishery communications plans. I would think, I would hope that, you know, they'll be ready and willing to talk about, you know, maybe tribal communications or um, the um, the industry communications plans. It's still coming together, but um, they will be joining us and, um, you know, the, we don't even have an agenda yet, so this is all still kind of fresh, but, um, but we will have the meeting. It will start at 10 a.m. on June 6th, but it will not include anything on the draft Oregon wind and energy areas. Um, hey, Carrie, yeah, can I jump in real quick? Yes. Yeah, so just some, some somewhat breaking news. We learned yesterday that Bohm had counter executed the leases, so I think those leases are now valid. Ah, okay. Good to know. So they, yeah, they're no longer provisional lease uh, winners. They are now leaseholders. Okay, so it's official. It's good yep. to know. Okay. Um, do you want to talk now about uh, putting together the uh, MPC report for the advanced briefing book just to get it on people's radar screens? Yeah, I think we should. Um, we, yeah. We've got a couple minutes before ten fifteen. Um, Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have to have the our our report one submitted by Wednesday of next week. Yeah, yeah, it's by Wednesday of next week, and so we wanted to have um, sections for whoever's writing up their sections. And the MPC received an email on this a couple of days ago. Um, we would like to have drafts of those no later than Monday COB. Uh, we'll turn it in around into um, a full report and send it by the next morning. And then we want comments back on that. Um, I think we said 8 a.m. Wednesday morning. Uh, so it's a very quick turnaround, but it's also, you know, it should be manageable. I mean, we're basically doing state updates. Um, we have a little more detail on the California uh, updates this time around. Um, but anyway, it's tight turn, tight turnaround, but I think it should be doable. So whoever is putting together your state reports, um, please make sure you have your sections into me and Mike and Susan by Monday COB. Yeah, and, and I apologize in advance to both Steve and Crystal, but I might, might have volunteered the three of us to take the lead on the, on drafting the California portion. I'm good Sorry. with that, Mike. <laughs> Same here. That works for Thanks. me. Thanks. Yes, um, Mike is uh, very adept at voluntelling and being voluntold. <laughs> so <laughs> you're an old hand at this. I don't see Katie Westfall on. Lila? I'm here, Carrie. Oh, you are? Oh, I there am. you are. Okay. Hello. There you are. Okay, good. Well, then I think we're probably Mike, Susan, are we ready to wrap up our um, opening clunky remarks? Apologize again for <laughs> my technical difficulties. My other computer is still frozen up. I can't even, it won't let me do anything. I, but I'm afraid to do a hard power down because that might shut down the whole meeting. So anyway, we might just have to wing it like this. I think so we're Mike, good to Susan? go. Yep. Okay, good. Well, then, in that case, Lila, I'd like to turn to you, please, to uh, introduce our um, our first presenter, um, Katie Westfall. So, Lila. All right. Thank you, Carrie. You can hear me okay? Yes, sure can. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm happy to introduce Katie Westfall today, who recently joined NOAA Fisheries as a senior advisor on offshore wind to our Assistant Administrator for Fisheries, Janet Coit. In this role, Katie's focused on improving the efficiency of NOAA Fisheries offshore wind permitting and on enhancing external coordination. And Katie's gonna be bringing her extensive experience in natural resource conservation to her role. And she's located right now on the East Coast in our headquarters office, but Katie's lived and worked on the West Coast, including um, she's had some involvement with the Pacific Fishery Management Council. 
And most recently, she served as the Senior Director of Resilient Fisheries at uh, the Environmental Defense Fund. And prior to that, she also worked for Congressman Jared Hafman of California as a NOAA Sea Grant Canals Fellow. So since starting with us, um, she's been getting steeped in all the East Coast offshore wind issues, and we're excited to be working with Katie now on the West Coast. So um, with that, welcome, Katie. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lila. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, as Lila mentioned, I've uh, overseen efforts um, in the Pacific Fishery, uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council, and so it's um, kind of feels I'm very familiar with some of the issues that you all uh, deal with, um, and I see a few familiar names on this committee as well. So it's an honor to be invited to speak with you all today um, and to get to know the Marine Planning Committee a little bit better. Um, as Lila mentioned a little bit about me, I have uh, 15 years of natural resource conservation experience. Um, I really have been focused at the intersection of environmental policy, policy politics, science, and communications. Um, I was most recently at EDF, uh, where I served as the Senior Director of Resilient Fisheries and oversaw all the work in, uh, to achieve sustainable and economically viable U.S. fisheries. Uh, in that role, I worked very closely with fishermen, uh, industry representatives, supply chain actors, technology providers, conservation groups, policymakers, uh, and researchers, um, and really kind of trying to get to that goal of sustainable uh, e of good sustainability, economic performance, and resilience um, through policy, science, and technology solutions. Um, I also was on the Hill previously. Worked for it was an, it was an honor to work for Congressman Jared Huffman um, on policy issues related to fisheries and oceans. Um, it has been an honor to join the NOAA team um, and to support the administration's goal of deploying offshore wind uh, while maintaining the health of marine ecosystems, ensuring the vitality of our fishing sectors, and improving the resilience of coastal communities. So in my, in my role, I serve as an advisor to NOAA Fisheries Assistant Administrator Janet Point, uh, specifically on offshore wind. Uh, as Lila mentioned, part of my role is to liaise internally uh, with the federal government across agencies. And also a big part of my role is to work externally with stakeholders. And in particular, I've been working with developers, the fishing industry, uh, states, tribes, and others to develop and, deep, and deepen partnerships, um, both at the national level and at the regional levels. Um, I will be working closely with the NIMS West Coast region and the Southwest and Northwest Science Centers, including leadership, their offshore wind team, and Lila. Um, I'm getting up, I'm quickly getting up to speed on all things offshore wind in the West Coast, and we'll also be sharing with them issues and approaches on the East Coast to really make sure that we are uh, doing the best to incorporate lessons learned as we uh, move forward on the West Coast. So in addition, I'm also looking at bigger picture ways of the permitting process and coordination across federal agencies and externally can be improved. Um, and at NOAA, more broadly, we are committed to facilitating offshore wind um, and meeting the president's goal of uh, deploying 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 and really uh, making sure that we are protecting biodiversity and promoting ocean co-use in the process. Um, and as you all know, um, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, is the lead agency responsible for offshore, offshore energy exploration uh, and development in the U.S. NOAA Fisheries uh, plays a consulting federal agency role. We are focused on minimizing the impacts to ocean resources, critical habitat, and fishing opportunities through planning the planning, siting, and development stages. So our roles are really focused on uh, regulatory authorizations and environmental review, uh, science, data, and services to inform decision making and engaging with state, federal, and tribal partners, as well as stakeholders. Um, a few updates on uh, kind of national level uh, and East Coast efforts. Uh, to date, so I'm going to talk a little bit about FY24 budget, uh, fisheries mit survey mitigation efforts, uh, the, the North Atlantic right well strategy, and fisheries compensation. So I'll touch on a few topics that I think uh, will be of interest, uh, and then I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Um, so on, on budget, that for FY24, we made um, 
Generally, we've made significant progress on permitting and environmental re reviews of large offshore wind projects. Uh, this has required us to really expand capacity in FY22 and FY23 to focus demands for our services, start building our teams uh, in other regions in anticipation of offshore wind development, and begin to address and mitigate the impacts to our scientific surveys. So the administration recognizes the incredible needs related to our role and has, has included increases to our budget to keep up with the extensive new workload and impacts to our scientific surveys. So additional funding in the FY24 budget is really intended to ensure that the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic is fully supported um, to meet current and future challenges related to regulatory and scientific review. Um, also to make sure we're providing uh, resources in preparation for increased demands in other regions like the West Coast and to continue to prioritize funding for planning um, to mitigate impacts on no fishery scientific surveys. So this is across regions and includes the West Coast as well. So in terms of the fishery survey mitigation strategy, I want to touch on that a little bit, which is specific to the East Coast to the East Coast. Um, so NOAA Fisheries and BOEM work together to create the federal uh, survey mitigation strategy, uh, which is focused on in the Northeast region. And it's really intended to guide the development and implementation of a program to mitigate impacts of wind energy development on fisheries over the full duration, which is 30 plus years of wind energy in the Northeast. The mitigation program will include um, survey specific mitigation plans for each impacted survey, including both vessel and aerial surveys. Um, and this strategy is specific you know, to the Northeast, but it is generally applicable to other regions of the country as well. So NOAA, is work, NOAA Fisheries is working to draft specific mitigation plans uh, for each of the 13 surveys that are impacted by wind development. Uh, and I understand the Pacific Council is, is concerned about impacts to NOAA Fisheries West Coast scientific surveys as, as we are as well. Um, and I'm aware that the West Coast NIMS team has convened teams to begin exploring survey mitigation needs and issues and are working towards developing a West Coast survey mitigation strategy also. Um, I'm going to touch on the North Atlantic right whale strategy on the East Coast. Um, so on the East Coast, we have the critically endangered uh, North Atlantic right whales, uh, which really uh, necessitates precaution in ensuring that offshore wind development is carried out in a way that minimizes uh, the potential for adverse effects. Uh, on the species and the, eco and the ecosystem on which it depends. Um, so BOEM and NOAA Fisheries initiated development of this shared strategy to focus and integrate past and present and future efforts related to North Atlantic right whales and offshore wind development. So the strategy includes three buckets of um, actions, uh, mitigation and decision support tools, research and monitoring, and collaboration, uh, communication, and outreach. So it was released out for comment uh, in October 2022. Uh, there was quite a bit of interest. The agencies received over uh, 7,500 7, comment letters on the draft strategies. So we're now working through uh, those comments uh, to identify a list of appropriate changes. And once the strategy is finalized, uh, BOEM and NOAA Fisheries will uh, b basically notify um, outside groups about its availability. So in addition, NIMS is providing technical input uh, to the National Academies of Science. Um, they have a um, group that has convened evaluating uh, hydrodynamics impacts from offshore wind um, on right whale prey. And this evaluation is sponsored by BOEM and there's, there's some good information online if anybody's interested on that. Um, so I'm going to touch briefly on um, fisheries compensation, so compensating for impacts to fishing communities. Uh, we also continue to provide technical input to BOEM on the social and impact, social and economic impacts of offshore wind um, to fishing communities. Uh, no fisheries does not have a direct role in determining compensation mitigation to fisheries affected by offshore wind. Um, but this is a topic that's getting a lot of attention on the Hill, and we've provided technical uh, drafting assistance on these efforts to several Hill offices. Um, on the East Coast, there's also a special initiative for offshore wind that's bringing states together uh, to establish a regional fund administer for uh, fisheries compensatory mitigation, which would provide basically fi financial compensation for economic loss related to offshore wind development on the East Coast. I'm happy to provide uh, info on that effort as well.
um, there's also some good information online uh, for uh, that work. And then I'll wrap up with a few thoughts about uh, looking ahead and share some of Assistant Administrator uh, Administrator Coit's priorities. Um, so we are continuing to prioritize work to get ahead of offshore wind planning as much as possible. So I'm sure this group has talked about the importance of spatial planning to really help co-users of the ocean avoid conflicts early in the process. Uh, NOAA continues to assist BOEM with siting offshore wind energy uh, by developing comprehensive spatial models so that BOEM can consider hundreds of types of data to characterize ocean environments and in, in industry, including uh, related to the fishing sector. Uh, we continue to work with BOEM on applying successes from the Gulf of Mexico to other areas. Uh, that was a region that um, where there was particularly good collaboration with the fishing sector. Um, expansion of the use of marine spatial planning can really help ensure that we are meeting um, you know, our, our goal of achieving ocean co-use. Uh, and I'm aware that the West Coast NIPS team is providing technical assistance and recommendations to BOEM on the Oregon spatial model, uh, and that NIMS and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife worked on a fishery analysis for the, for the model as well. Um, another important effort moving forward is related to, to education and really uh, promoting a shared understanding of our regulatory processes via training for developers and action agencies, really making sure that they understand our ob obligations under Magnuson-Stevens Act, under um, uh, Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, so that includes providing um, technical guidance and checklists. Looking ahead, this will become increasingly important for the West Coast. Um, and then just a, a few thoughts on increasing capacity for regulatory review. So as you know, offshore winds work is expanding regionally and is, has created enormous workloads. Uh, we are likewise uh, working to ensure that we have the capacity to handle this influx and preserve the necessary capacity for all other uh, NOAA fisheries responsibilities. And then in terms of bolstering scientific capacity, uh, we all know that scientific expertise remains critical uh, to achieving the administration's offshore wind goals. Uh, we really need to make sure that we're pri prioritizing our, our, um, the importance of our science and characterizing impacts to fisheries, protected resources, and their habitats, um, as well as the marine ecosystem writ large. Ensuring our ability to fully mitigate uh, offshore wind on our scientific sur surveys remains critical as we continue to work with BOEM and other partners. Uh, so just in sum, um, I just want to re-emphasize the importance of supporting the goal of deploying offshore wind while protecting biodiversity and promoting ocean co-use. We really have to balance the development of, of clean energy with sustainably managing our marine trust resource and just extend an invitation to um, the folks on this committee um, to reach out to me um, you know, personally on, on any issues. Um, and I, part of my role is to really uh, to connect with stakeholders. And it's frankly one of my favorite parts of the role. So uh, my door is open and would, would invite um, folks to reach out. So I will stop there and see if there's any questions. Um, I might have, might have gone on too long. Uh, so sorry about that. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Oopsie. Um, very informative and helpful. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and Susan, the two co-chairs, do you think we have a minute or two for a couple of questions? I think so. A couple minutes. And and sorry for the background noise. Um, I'd say, yeah, if someone on the Marine Planning Committee has a question, why don't you put your hand up? I see Steve and Mike have their hands up. I think Steve, you were first. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Katie. Uh, I'm Steve Joner. I'm with the Macaw Tribe, um, and um, I guess we don't have a lot of time, so I'll I'll get right to the point. Um, Treaty tribes in the Northwest don't share the enthusiasm for offshore wind. Uh, early on, uh, the tribes became concerned about the cumulative impacts of all this industrialization of the ocean and the impacts to the California current ecosystem and how that could affect the tribes, uh, treaty fisheries, you know, their economies and culture. And so I've been very active in that, uh, representing the Macaw tribe. 
we have brought this up to Boehm for almost two years now, and there's been very little response in really looking into these impacts. You know, my question first about upwelling. I mean, that's just kind of the, the, the starting point. But we get into all sorts of concerns uh, that deal with the ocean processes with larval sable fish that are uh, on the ocean surface that for some of their life. The, the migration of uh, whiting, for example, from California up through Oregon and into Washington and eventually into British Columbia, where I'll, I'll add that the United States has an obligation to Canada through the Pacific Whiting Treaty. And um, I've not heard that mentioned at all in any of this conversation with uh, NOAA Fisheries or BOEM, but that's certainly something that uh, needs to be considered, uh, how all this uh, development could impact the uh, uh, productivity and availability of whiting. Um, and then, of course, the impact on marine mammals. Uh, you are fully aware of the, the difficulty we're having uh, with the southern resident killer whales and managing our fisheries. The Alaska troll fishery was recently closed by a federal judge because of the impact on southern resident killer whales. Um, and they don't spend all their time in Puget Sound. They're out in the ocean for a great part of their the year. Uh, so, as a result of these concerns, the, the Macaw tribe, uh, the Quinault tribe also has been very active in this, uh, have taken a leadership role in with the different uh, tribal groups. And so most recently, the uh, uh, Northwest tribes uh, passed a resolution asking Boehm to suspend all the surveys and, and leases that they're now doing until the questions with the tribes are resolved. So both the, the, the national group, NCAI, and the Northwest group, ATNI, have done these resolutions. So I won't take any more time other than to say that um, I feel like somebody uh, back in the 1930s and 40s who was uh, expressing concern about what the Columbia River dams would do to the salmon and of course, those those pleas and cries for uh, doing it properly uh, went unheeded. And of course, now we know the history, the decline of the resource, how that's impacted both tribal and non-tribal fisheries. And uh, as somebody growing up on the Columbia River, I personally observed the decline uh, brought on by the dams. And of course, we had a national need for that electricity. But again, it could have been done much better, and we wouldn't have had this ongoing problem. So, our our call is to slow this down and let's let's answer these questions first, because the tribes, the courts have repeatedly ruled that the tribes have a right to have their resources available to them, which means the habitat that the the fish grow in must be protected. So, um, thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Steve, for sharing those concerns. And I know that you're serving on the Standing Committee for Offshore Wind uh, and Fisheries and really appreciate your participation in that committee. And I would love to connect with you and talk about these concerns uh, in, in more depth. So um, I, I will connect with Lila and, and make sure that we get connected um, so we can talk about these important, important issues. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Hey, Mike, can you ask your questions in 30 seconds or less? Because I know it's at least one of the state agency folks has a commitment and, and is running short on time. I think so. Uh, first, I echo all the concerns uh, that Steve did on uh, ecosystem services, broad based. Second, uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but I'd like to get an answer on biodiversity, what that means to you. And would you put your contact information in the chat, please, Katie? Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yes, I'm happy to, um, to pop my information in the chat or to follow up with Carrie to make sure that the committee has uh, my email address. Um, but I think in terms of, of biodiversity, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, 
making sure that we're protecting, uh, you know, our fish stocks and the ecosystem and, um, you know, our protected resources as well. So basically the entire marine, marine ecosystem. Um, and I know there are many folks who depend on it for uh, many different uses and for livelihoods. And I know it's a, a critical concern to, to many folks. So that's, that's how I would answer. Thanks for that. Carrie, are we, are we good? Yeah, I think it's um, time to move on to our next speakers from California and my, um, I should be able to show the slideshows that were sent to me. I think 2 of them uh, have some slides, but why don't you go ahead and move us on to the next item? And thank you very much Katie for joining us. We really appreciate it. I know we gave you. Short shrift 15 short minutes that was um, truncated, but we appreciate you introducing yourself to the uh, marine planning committee and to others out here in the West and um, look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for that. Um, so, yeah, so we have 3 distinguished members from 3 distinguished agencies from the state of California. We have Jason from the state lands commission, Holly from the. California Coastal Commission, and I see Scott and then I saw Danielle. Let me see if she's still here. And Danielle are both from the California Energy Commission. Um, I'm assuming that Holly or Jason will start us off. Um, have, you, have you guys figured out who wants to go first? I don't think we have, but I have. I have to go at 11. So, Jason, if you don't have a similar time, well, why don't we just start with you? Then, right Molly. If I went first. Yeah, go. Okay, great. Um, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Holly Wire. I'm a senior environmental scientist at the California Coastal Commission. Um, I'm also our agency's lead on offshore wind. Um, our commission has a role in offshore wind through federal consistency review and not to go into too much detail, detail on it, but federal consistency um, is provided to the states through the Coastal Zone Management Act, and it allows the states to have a formal say in federal projects or processes that have an, an impact on the coast and the state's coastal resources. Um, in our case, we do federal consistency review twice during development of offshore wind. The first is prior to BOEM's lease sale, and then the second is prior to their approval of a construction and operations plan. We completed our review of BOEM's lease sale in California last year, um, and we conditioned that lease sale with seven different conditions. Today, I'm just going to speak about one of them, condition number seven, and that was specifically designed to address fishing impacts. Um, condition 7 requires lessees to have an independent fisheries liaison that's responsible for communicating with commercial and recreational fishing communities and harbor districts. Um, it requires lessees to submit reports on their process, outreach, and outcomes of their engagement with fishing communities. Um, and finally, it requires BOEM to work with us to develop and facilitate a working group that includes fishing organizations and representatives from different regions and ports of the state um, and representatives of different fisheries and gear types both in the commercial and recreational sectors. And the goal of this group is to develop a statewide strategy for avoidance, minimization, and mitigation of impacts to fishing and fisheries. And we really want the priority of that strategy to be on long-term fisheries resilience. Um, and so we have a number of different requirements for that strategy that will be developed through this working group. Um, that includes protocols for communication, best practices for surveys and data collection, um, methodologies for socioeconomic analysis of direct and indirect impacts to fishing, and a framework for compensatory mitigation for unavoidable impacts. Um, I bring this all up because we're in the process of developing nomination forms for fisheries representatives, and we're aiming to get those out within a month um, with the goal of having all of our representatives and a meeting schedule in place by August. So if you know of fisheries representatives that would be interested in participating in this group that fish in California, um, we would be happy to send you a nomination form in a little bit. Um, so please feel free to get in touch. 
Um, and I also wanted to mention that we have secured some funding through our partners at the Ocean Protection Council to provide compensation for fishing representatives for their participation at meetings um, to offset the costs of not going fishing. And so, yeah, I would welcome any assistance you could provide in spreading the word on our call for nominations. And I'm also happy to answer questions about how we interact with BOEM and how what our role is in offshore wind development. Thanks, Holly. I, I just have one quick question and I forget, so don't shoot me if I don't remember. Did the, did, does the working group include processors? Um, actually, I was just asked this. They weren't explicitly called out in condition 7C. I think there's could be value in having them on there and I'd be open to input from anyone here on that. Thanks. I think you would uh, your support for that, <laughs> but I don't want to speak up okay. for the processing community. <clears throat> Does anybody else have any questions for Holly? I see Steve Scheiblauer has his hand up, and then Mike Ogineski. Hello, Holly. Yeah, I am going to ask you a sort of a familiar question. Which is should should disagreements occur between the members of this working group? How will those disagreements be resolved? You know, we will have facilitation services for this working group, and I believe that we will be on a system of some kind of majority vote. It might need to be two thirds or something. But I, there will be a decision making process as established as part of the working group to resolve disagreements. Thank you. Michael. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mike. And thank you, Holly. I'll echo what Mike had to say about the processors. There's a lot of concern and uh, that area about offshore wind and the effects it'll have on their ability to maintain their business structures or maintain their business at all. So uh, it's it's real important to that group as well. So thank you. Thank you. Last call for questions for Holly. Mike, do you have a new question or is that just a residual hand? Uh, Steve, please. Spoke. I don't know what to do now. Okay. <laughs> Steve, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to let Holly know that um, uh, a couple of us from the tribes try to get into that onto that listening session a couple of days ago and uh i don't know if you know what happened there but yeah was, so um the, i tried to get on the second day and by then it was closed so i contacted uh sierra graves and explained that uh you know there were tribes in in washington and oregon that were dependent on uh, resources that uh, originate in or, or migrate through California waters and and we want to be involved and so she's she's gotten back to me and we're just trying to find a time next week where we can have a call so I just want to let you know that but. thank you for sharing that I I appreciate you reaching out and I'm really sorry about what happened on that call on Monday night that's that's the first time I've ever experienced zoom bombing yeah. um yeah so I'm glad you're reaching out. Um, and if you have follow-up questions for me about the Coastal Commission specifically, please feel free to reach out. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, I've been talking a lot about Condition 7 and our uh, Energy Commission is doing a bigger offshore wind strategic planning process in California, which is part of what those listening sessions are for. But one big difference between and we're coordinating on all of it, but one big difference between AB 525, it is, it's very forward looking to the future and the condition 7C working group is really focused on the leases that have already been issued. Um, I'm sure it absolutely will have, you know, implications for future leases in California in the future. Um, but just to like make sure everyone knows kind of the, the distinction between those two processes.
Thanks for that, Steve. Thanks, Holly. Holly, I think we're going to get you out early. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I appreciate you having me and feel free to reach oh. out if you have any further questions for me. Hold on. Might have spoke too soon. M M Mike's got his hand up again. Go ahead, Mike. You know, Holly, um, I was involved in that uh, little debacle that happened. I used some expressions that I probably shouldn't have, and it was found out that they just not sent it out to the audience. They thought they did, and I understand mistakes happen, so we move on. But the one point I wanted to make was, as Steve Joner brought up, there's at least two species that uh, start out in California in their life cycle, uh, hake and uh, or whiting, and also sardines. Sardines are in the low ebb right now with their cycle, but uh, the fisheries in the Northwest are tremendously uh, tribal and non-tribal are tremendously de uh, dependent on those fish. So uh, even though it's they originate in California, they end up in the Northwest. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, now now I think you're in the clear, Holly. <laughs> it was good seeing you yesterday, and thank you for uh, coming and joining us today. Jason, we're going to put you on the hot seat. Yeah, thanks, Mike. This is Jason Ramos. I'm with the California mm -hmm. State Lands Commission and with our Division of Environmental Science Planning and Management. I'm the uh, project manager for the environmental impact report for the Cadavo offshore wind project. Um, Carrie, are you able to pull up the slides I provided to you? Yes, I'm pulling it up right now. Give me two seconds. These were the two slides, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you see that slide? I do. Okay. I'll go able to, to uh, do the expand it. Yep. I will do okay. that. Okay. Great. Okay. How's that? Be able to add, turn that off. That oh, time. that is the weird. Okay. Hold on. I know how to fix this. <laughs> Swap. There, how's that? Thank you. Okay. So, I understood that you were looking for more of an update on the EIR process. So, I'll, I'll focus my time on that. Uh, and I, I think probably easier if we, if possible, if we could take questions at the end. And uh, just let me do a run through on some of this. I'll start with a quick update on the project, though. Um, quick, quick update and recap. Um, so, just to begin with, for those of you that aren't familiar, the State Lands Commission has received a lease application for Kadema Corporation uh, for four floating uh, wind turbines in state waters off the coast of Vandenberg Space Force Base in western Santa Barbara County, as represented on the uh, figure here for the project area, including showing the proposed onshore electrical facilities. And there's a couple updates with the project uh, that I'll Go ahead and raise here. Uh, we previously also had an application from a, a different applicant, BW Ideal. They were also proposing four floating wind turbines uh, just north of the Cadamo uh, lease area, shown in yellow. And in February of this year, they withdrew their application. So that project is out. And we're now proceeding with the IR, uh, with an EIR for just the, the Cadamo uh, project. Um, and also previously with the Cadamo project, uh, there were Originally focusing on Port Wanimi for uh, as the port location to support their construction services, and they're no longer uh, looking at Port Wanimi uh, for that purpose. They're uh, now looking at the Port of San Francisco for construction of the floating platforms, and then the uh, Port of Los Angeles for integration of the wind turbines with the, the floating platforms. So, a couple new uh, updates with that. Next slide, please.
Great. So this is a flow chart of our environmental review process, um, starting on the left-hand side. So we've already completed our early public scoping stakeholder consultation process, which included preparation of a preliminary environmental assessment document and a series of stakeholder outreach meetings. And so we're now um, getting ready to start through the, uh, the CEQA environmental review process. We're at the beginning of that now entering on the right-hand side of the flow chart here. Uh, we recently hired Aspen Environmental Group as our environmental consultant to prepare the EIR. And um, another development is we're currently working to complete an agreement with uh, Vandenberg Space Force Base and the U.S. Department of Air Force to prepare a joint EIR NEPA document, which will likely be uh, an environmental impact statement or a, an environmental assessment level document, whereby the U.S. Department of Air Force is expected to serve as the federal lead for NEPA. And after formal agreement with the Department of Air Force, we'll work towards proceeding with the scoping process for the EIR NEPA document, which will include a, a, a public notice to solicit public scoping comments for preparation of the, the draft document. And we'll hold a public meeting to take public comment, likely in the town of Lompoc or another location uh, near the project area. Um, following the scoping process, we'll proceed with uh, preparing the admin draft uh, for the joint document, uh, which will build from the information gathered from our previous uh, preliminary environmental assessment document and process. Uh, we'll continue, we'll include continued consultation with uh, uh, state, federal, local, you know, responsible trustee agencies, more continued rounds of, of stakeholder outreach along the way of developing that document. Uh, we'll also be working with the joint review panel with the Coastal Commission and NOAA. Uh, to coordinate preparation of the EIR and NEPA document. And essentially when we've taken the document through that process and we have a draft document uh, available, uh, then we'll, we'll also re release that for public review and comment. That'll include another uh, public meeting to take public comment on the document. That'll be a big test for us at that point to uh, see the extent that we've satisfied the information uh, public process um, and if we're ready to move forward with uh, preparing a final EIR, or, or if there's more work to do in the way of uh, additional uh, information analysis, et cetera, uh, before we're ready to move forward with the final EIR. Uh, but when we do, when we get to that point, um, we'll prepare the final EIR, and then that'll lead towards our commission meeting um, at the end of the process for EIR certification um, and consideration of a, a lease for the project as well. Uh, all of this information is available on our website. Uh, both these slides come directly from our website. We try to keep it current so that you can go there and uh, be up to speed on current information with the project. Uh, when we have uh, you know a public meeting coming up to take comment on the document or other uh, uh, important uh, information or milestones associated with the project. But essentially, that's a high level overview of uh, what we've done so far with the environmental re review process, where we're currently at, and the next steps to take the document through the, the remaining CEQA process with that. Um, and that's about it on, on my end. So happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Um, it's really good to get an update. We haven't talked about these projects for a while, so I appreciate it. Let's see. Um, in keeping with our technical difficulties, it sounds like Mike got uh, kicked off. So <laughs> he's trying to log back in. Um, I do see one hand up, and it is Steve Scheiblauer. Steve, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Kerry. Uh, Jason, can you confirm if I'm right that the primary purpose of this proposed project is not necessarily production of any significant amount of electricity, but, but rather as a demonstration? project about offshore floating offshore wind. And if it is a demonstration, uh, is there a place that we could find uh, the goals of the demonstration? Thank you. Yeah, Kademo does refer to their project as a demonstration project. Uh, you know, part of what they're demonstrating here is uh, two different types of floating platform technology. Uh, uh, two of the wind turbines will be uh, a barge, floating barge design with a single point mooring. Connection to the other platforms will be a, a tension leg platform uh, that has a different mooring arrangement um, and, and cable connection uh, arrangement with it as well. Um, 
with the uh, notice of preparation that we release, um, that'll go over, that'll include uh, information on the goals, objectives, and purpose of the project uh, with it. The, and keep in mind, these are applicant uh, goals, objectives with the project. Um, and so that's that's where you'll you'll see that information. And then also we we also have it covered previously in the uh, preliminary environmental assessment document that we did. And there's a link to that on our website uh, for our state applicate for this uh, particular project. It's on our state applications page. That can be accessed through our renewable energy program, and there'll be a direct link to this uh, a web page for this project. Thank you. Maybe one follow up. When do you expect the first opportunity for public comment on this to, to occur? Well, for the joint document, that'll be through um, the scoping process. Um, that'll we're working to, you know, as I explained earlier, we're working to complete our agreement with them. Once that's done, then we'll start working towards um, our uh, scoping process. That'll you'll see it. A notice that goes out with that that'll also be posted on our website. Um, we have a, a mailing distribution list as well that we uh, prepared when we did our preliminary environmental document and meetings associated with that. So everyone on that list will will be notified as well. Uh, I, don't, I don't have an exact date, but we're, it, it's anticipated to happen this year. Hopefully, hopefully within the next uh, five months, um, we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, that'll be the first opportunity for public comment. Thank you. Sure. Michael Ganeski, go yeah. ahead. Your hand's up next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I may have missed this, but is the public comment and basically the focus stakeholder discussion, and I guess the whole list you've got outlined there, um, just relative to the I guess small project you're doing, or is it uh, more relative to the general uh, expansion of offshore wind energy that's going to happen in California? The the public comment process will be specific just to this project. Um, it uh, so yeah, I won't duplicate what I said previously on that, but it, it it is focused just on this project. This project is is not part of the. A uh, larger BOEM uh, process within their wind areas. Um, I won't go into too deep about that, but uh, I, th I think that's I think that's the gist of of uh, the response you were looking for. Okay, that what I think would think that would make a big difference for, um, I guess, how you structure your comments, but um, as part of the public. But I appreciate the uh, presentation. Thank you. Sure. Corey Niles, I see your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Um, th I'm just curious. Um, it looks like from your graphics that you have the location is set. So, um, you know, in Nipen, I'm imagining your CEQA is similar as to compare and contrast alternatives. Um, so, do you have it? What will you be having alternatives that you're analyzing? And what what might those look like? Um, is just the no action kind of versus the project? Yeah, with both CEQA and NEPA, we'll be working together to do an alternatives analysis. These are essentially alternatives from the, the proposed project that uh, attempt to reduce impacts while still meeting uh, most of the, the goals, objectives of the project. Um, when we release the notice of preparation, uh, there'll be some information there on alternatives uh, that, that we anticipate, but um, that's part of what we're looking for in the scoping process is to get comments on what alternatives we should be looking at. Uh, for the project, and that we'll take that information and then develop a more uh, a more comprehensive analysis of alternatives and weed out the ones that are found to be infeasible and and focus on the ones that that are identified as feasible and carry those forward for analysis with the project. Thank you. Mike, oh, I saw your hand. Oh, no, it went back. Um, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Is it safe to assume, uh, Jason, that prior comments, uh, public comments during the prior opportunities will be automatically integrated into the CEQA and NEPA analysis? 
That's correct. We're going to build up. We're going to build up the, the prior uh, process that we did for the preliminary environmental assessment document. Carry those forward, and um, the notice of preparation will, will be more. Uh, won't get in. Won't really won't get beyond at this point. Uh, just stating the basic background, purpose, objectives, and a project description. Uh, with that, but certainly um, the the comments that we have will will feed into that to the extent that it applies to those sections. And then when we get past the scoping process, uh, certainly we'll we'll be uh, working with the prior comments as well as the the new ones that we get from the scoping process to develop the the uh, analysis of impacts, mitigation measures, and uh, the full production of the document moving forward. Steve, if you had a follow up, we had to mute you because there was an echo. No, uh, no follow up. No. Okay. All right, I don't see any other hands up. So, should we move on to our 3rd California speaker? Yeah, thanks Jason for for attending and, and going through this with us. It's appreciated. You bet. Thanks. Danielle and. Scott. Hi, um, hi, this is Scott Flint from the California Energy Commission. I'm going to run us through. The next set of slides um, and give you an update on our activities. Um, related to assembly bill 525 in California, and that's the. Bill that assigns the energy commission the responsibility for developing. A strategic plan for offshore wind in California. Um, I my sharing is disabled, so can you can share the slides with that in that would be great. Oh yeah, either way, I can share it now, or I can enable you to do to share. What's your preference? No, um, this is fine. They're okay. they're already there and ready to go. Yep, just got them going here. And I think it's a <laughs> PDF. It's a PDF. I hope that doesn't complicate things. It was too big to send it. But I yeah, think you I can move know. through them one slide at a time. Yeah. Um, just wondering Otherwise, I can... I can share either way. Um, well, so, how is that? <laughs> Does that work or is that too? No, that looks fine to me. If I, It's up to others if they can see it or not. Tell you, you what, Scott. Push control L. Oh, what's Control L? Control L will turn it to slideshow mode. Oh, oh. oh how about that? Thank there you. There you go. Okay, let's do that. Okay, I have quite a few slides to go through, uh, and this is a complicated issue, so I'll be as um, succinct as possible so we can have some discussion. So in, uh, uh, so work with BOEM in California for offshore wind started in 2016, and the result of that work are the, lease, the leases that are just currently being signed in California. So we have two things going on at the same time, but they're in a, and they are interrelated, but separate. So I'll try to lay that, clarify that as much as possible. Um, the state agencies are working with BOEM on implementation of the uh, leases in California and that work will just be starting in earnest with studies of the lease areas by the lessees, the um, successful bidders. Um, so that will start with site characterization work, um, which will then lead to development plans within a couple of years for those sites. Second item, the second item that we're working on is a planning exercise for future offshore wind in California. And the legislature with AB 525 asked some questions uh, for us to answer uh, and made some, of course, legislatively findings. So the questions being answered are in response to those findings. And the first one was if you know California chooses to embrace offshore wind as an industry, um, it needs to develop at scale off the California coast. So that was a legislative um, finding. And so the questions around that were, what would it take to, 
what would it take to get the, to get to goals that we establish in certain time frames and what would it look like from a perspective of what ports we would need what transmission we would need uh and where areas uh, other areas of the ocean would be that would support the development of offshore wind in california those were three broad questions that we're working on with different parts of the um strategic plan and the and the preliminary reports that have started to come out on the sea space component and for each component but on the sea space component it's called out specifically that we also look at impacts from um going forward in particular areas and with all of those uh support services that would be needed ports and transmission to bring offshore wind to california and um talk about the ways to offset those impacts at the highest level and so what we're finding as when we as we go through these things in the planning exercise part is we're not um we're using available information we're using science-based information but we're finding that um, that information is inconsistent and incomplete so as we go along we're identifying those data gaps that need to be filled and some work is already underway to fill some of those, but we are identifying them as we march towards identifying the strategic plan and the strategic plan will have other, will have recommendations on, and priorities for data gaps that need to be filled. And we'll talk about what we know and what we don't know to help paint that picture of what it would take um, to develop offshore wind at scale. So, um, the some impacts that we're seeing um like for fishermen some areas could result in it, it be completely incompatible incompatible offshore wind development may be completely incompatible with certain types of fishing and, and fishing gear and that means a, a loss of fishing grounds so some of the impacts we know the extent of what they would be and other impacts we don't know the extent of what they would be and that, those are um, on a lot of the ecological processes um, and some species. We know a little bit about what can happen based on past experience of the oil and gas industry putting infrastructure in the water in different places. And we know a little bit about uh, learning from Europe experience with offshore wind, but that's a different type of offshore wind that's mounted in the seabed and we're talking about a different technology here that's floating platform and then we have a little experience there's a little experience starting to be learned from the work on the east coast of the u.s to deploy offshore wind but those facilities aren't constructed or built yet but there are some lessons learned um, that we're looking at for how to um how, how to research and um, talk about those impacts so that we can figure out ways to address them so we've got the we've got planning for actual projects going on in the lease areas and we've and, we, and we've got this different type of planning big picture looking at sets of goals for california next slide please that hold on So this is an ongoing process and our current schedule um, has us having a draft of the um, calls for a draft of the strategic plan. And that's the complete plan that talks about all of those items, ports, ports, um, transmission, sea space impacts um, by June 30th to be out for public to start a public review and discussion prior to that we've been started we've been outreaching to affected communities uh to try uh, tribal nations affected communities for the fishermen included and we have some other outreach to do um one-on-one -on -one, and then we plan on having a sea space workshop uh june 1st that would be the first public discussion of sea space areas that we've been working to identify and kick off a, a conversation that would continue through and beyond the issuance of the strategic plan itself. So we're looking for feedback that helps inform that 
um, and take us farther than we are with the conversation right now. So, and that's based on what we know already and what we don't know. So the different than the different than the um, process that you just saw in the last slide, that's project specific for um, for a project and is tied to the CEQA process. We don't have an environmental review process here, but we have um, uh, extensive public process. And again, I don't expect it to end discussions on this issue. Uh, to end with the issuance of the strategic plan, the strategic plan will identify points that we need to continue to discuss with affected stakeholders, tribal nations, uh, local governments, and others if we want to um, uh, adopt offshore wind as a, as a strategy for California. And there are other, other planning processes that go on at the state for energy, um, development and they are looking you know so they're looking at other technologies and other sectors uh including terrestrial energy and that's our sb100 process which is also started up but will be running the next couple of years so sb100 will look at the look at the information that comes from the offshore wind strategic plan and be combining it with all the other work uh, of the energy agencies and the CEC to balance out what we might need to make the system reliable. And it, you know, we'll look at other technologies while our effort here is focused on the details of one at this moment. So we do have, we have meetings with the fishermen to talk specifically about sea space and the other area and the other um, topics. Uh, we have some virtual meetings in June after the workshop, and then we have the series of workshops that will, and I'm sorry, then we have in-person meetings that run through June scheduled um, up and down the state. And then we're available at any time to, to talk and work with fishermen and um, walk through our, what our challenges from the legislature and how we're addressing these items in our strategic plan. Then we have official workshops that are scattered. Some uh, those happen all before uh, the outreach. So you'll get more information in those workshops, um, get, a, get a chance to participate. Groups will get a chance to participate in those workshops. Um, uh, and then that'll help us with the more detailed conversations in the virtual and in-person meetings. So let me, next slide, please. So let me run through areas that we're talking about. So 525 asks us to look at suitable sea space in federal waters and to accommodate goals that we set for 2030 and 2045 for offshore wind. And those are aspirational planning goals of two to five gigawatts by 2030 and up to 25 gigawatts by 2045. So we're talking seven seven years out to about whatever that is 23 years that we have to work through some of these um, issues um and uh 525 specifically says that these areas could be input to a new round of bone leasing in the future so we are working with BOEM to make sure that we're using similar data and sharing data as appropriate and um, discussing our assumptions and how we're thinking about it in similar and different ways as we go through this process. Uh, 525 also asks for impact assessment uh, and specifically calls out coastal resources, fish, fishery, Native American and indigenous peoples, national defense. We're, we're also interpreting coastal resources broadly to mean the biology, ecology, and ecosystem functionality of, of the ocean and the coastline of California. And then, then identifying strategies to address those impacts. And as, like I said, some will be in more detail than others. Things that we're putting in place, um, like, like the section uh, 7C, process for dealing with fishing impacts would be something that we would obviously want to carry forward 
as an idea to address some of those impacts under the strategic plan, but we will obviously learn lessons around the way, uh, along the way uh, and develop methodologies that would be more specific that would then contribute to the conversation. Next slide, please. So, so on that map, you saw the areas that folks have studied. Um, so there are extensive areas off the North Coast that have been studied by NREL, Bone, um, and various uh, other academic institutions and the transmission entities in California to um, project what might be needed to support offshore wind. And we're pulling that information together and continuing to refine it. So one of, one of the things that we're looking at uh for input on so we've gotten quite a bit of feedback and input through the process from from lots of stakeholder groups and the tribes but we're so we're specifically focused on a couple things first off one is the um, implications of these other large areas that are in the ocean where the cable where the sorry where the turbine arrays would go because um, if those air if areas aren't workable there's no use in looking at the other potential impacts because those areas wouldn't be um, considered go further going forward but we do realize that when we look at areas and the strategic plan will also address and we look at those impacts ask or ask that 525 asks us to look at we'll be looking at um, the best we can, the impacts that would come from the uh, transmission cables to shore. We have studies going on about how those would route, um, and we can know a little bit more about those, but those locations aren't known until we get way down the road to a project development, but we can talk and we know how they would cross into shore, and we can talk in general about those sorts of impacts, and we have been, and we're capturing that information. Also, terrestrial impacts on the land for transmission need, and of course, impacts both onshore and uh, in the water for for port improvements and developments, and um, also for construction and um, operations and maintenance. Next slide, please. I guess it, it also pays to. to, to to say with that slide that that's the technology as we currently understand it, um, how it might go into the water, but those technologies haven't been picked. Folks are still working on floating platforms. So how many anchor and mooring lines they have, how many undersea cables they have connecting them to, to each other are, are, are details that won't be available until projects are designed. But we have a general idea and that's the reference that we're looking at right now to judge impacts. We expect continual improvements in technologies um, as we go forward over that period to 2045. That will again alter the conversation of what what the effects might be. So, Cal, this is California's wind resource um, from three miles offshore, uh, and this is the realm of what has been studied extensively for development of the call areas. We have pushed the envelope beyond this a little bit because we have pushed the envelope looking out in deeper waters. Um, the the um, knowing that conflicts that occur occur more severely the closer we are to shore. So we've looked at two things that we'll be talking about, and one is those conflicts that occur closer to shore uh, and the possibility of developing in deeper waters off the coast than have currently been anticipated. Um, developers themselves have asked us not to constrain them with a depth limit, so we're exploring some deeper depths. Um, uh, but the sweet spot we're looking for for to answer the legislature's question in 525 is what looks like it would it might be deployable or feasible and that means cost effective by the 2045 time frame next slide please so i just zoomed into the north coast to show um some features there and so this is the um the um, California exclusive economic zone uh, is the black boundary layer in the ocean here from three miles to 200 miles offshore. 
and we start at the California Oregon border and we go uh, we're going down past Fort Bragg on the south to the Gulf of the Farallones um, National Marine Sanctuary. So this is the uh, and then we push this sea space out to about 2,900 meters in depth where we've been looking. So next slide, please. This area meets certain um, needs for offshore wind um, that would provide the right sorts of power needed by California. So um, within that area, we have done some preliminary work, which I'll show you a little bit of there, but um, some preliminary work to identify areas of focus that we would look at more closely. And uh, our work has been to identify the conflicts that are occurring closer to shore um, that kind of pushes these areas back to about 20 miles off the coast. And then secondly, um, examining some of the challenges of developing these areas in deeper waters. And um, then um, looking at what the conflicts are in each of these areas. And so that's our charge under 525. And as part, and then from the conflicts, there's a chain of, we know there are conflicts simply because things are happening in these areas in the ocean. There's ocean uses, fishing being one of them. There's shipping. Uh, there's a lot of conflicts that still show up in these areas that we would need to talk about and work through. And part of our job is to surface those conflicts and in, in this report and talk about steps to work through them. Secondly, we would talk about the challenges of developing deeper to let the industry know that they have to be prepared for that and technology has to advance to a point where we could be looking deeper off the California coast to lessen conflicts. The problem with that is that the farther out you go, the less information we have. So we still have a lack of information about even going far, what far out in the ocean and what actually do. Um, in specific areas. And so we have a lot of work to do, collect, continuing to collect information. Next slide, please. So just to show by way of um, our analysis has been simple. Um, and we, for a couple of reasons, we don't have the time or budget to do anything really more specific. So we've been focused on using the available information to start with California's, uh, the first leg of California's avo avoidance and minimization strategy, and that's what can we avoid by locating in certain areas. <clears throat> so you see a couple different representations of commercial fishery information here for the North, North Coast, and the simple way we've been using that is overlaying it and seeing what occurs in these different areas. So by having the areas identified on the right, sorry, on the left panel, we're looking at the, the information from the North Coast Fisheries Project that the fishermen provided to us. And it, that represents known, known and future, historic and future fishing grounds um, represented by habitat and species distributions. So we know by going a certain distance out, we're avoiding, there's about 18 fisheries represented here. So from a, the standpoint of where we put turbine fields, we're avoiding, uh, and there's a little bit of overlap here. These aren't final, um, these aren't any kind of final boundaries, but we have to put a boundary on something to be able to calculate the amount of energy that we might expect to come out of there. So you might see some little overlaps, but we basically, by going out 20 miles, we avoid um, 15 of 18 fisheries from the standpoint of putting turbines in the water, but that doesn't avoid the other impacts that would come from boat trips uh, and cables. So we still have those things to deal with. Um, and we also, this also helps us identify the three fisheries that we can't avoid uh, and still have, based on what we know now, um, um, commercially viable uh, electrical generation. And so we have an area of overlap that we need to explore further. On the right panel, we've looked at NOAA data and we continue to update data. This is some older um, NOAA observational data 
it kind of gives us a uh, picture of the intensity of fishing in the same area in the ground fishery only, which is one of the fisheries that, that remains affected 20 miles offshore. So on the left panel, it tells us ground fish, um, Chinook salmon, and highly migratory species are definitely things that we need to focus on in those areas. On the right, we're, we're looking at a different set of data that tells us a little different information and a little more um, and looking at how that lines up with those areas. And so we have, this sets up with the discussion that we need to have about those areas. Again, it looks like we're avoiding some of the more intense areas of fishing, at least based on this historical data. Uh, we've looked at some newer data than this from BOEM and it, it shows similar patterns, but we, but unlike BOEM has done their in cost modeling, we haven't yet, uh, we've tried to keep this simple and straightforward and focused on avoidance and we have not uh, assigned values to any of the, uh, any of the information that we're using. We also have similar information, uh, for that we're using in similar ways for marine mammals, five or six groups of those, including whales and other cetaceans, uh, and, um, and then for marine birds, uh, we have different sets of data that show that we can that we do reduce impacts to some degree, the farther offshore we go. And in our report, we'll be exploring what that means for each of those groups of things. Also, um, these areas still have other conflicts. They still have DOD conflict. They still have shipping conflict that, uh, in addition to fishing, and they still have conflicts with marine mammals and birds, but, um, that's what we'll be laying out in the report. Next slide, please. We have also, um, looked at the central coast to define, a, a additional area to help meet our goal because of the challenges and conflicts that we see on the north coast we thought it prudent to to look at the south coast too and treat it in a similar fashion and we're still in the middle of this work so this map doesn't look exactly the same but you see here the original diablo canyon call area in purple you see the original moral bay call area in yellow you see the outline of the leases in the black outline there in the middle. And then you see the additional area of wind speed the delineated by wind speed and depth uh, in orange that we are looking at to possibly add another area there. We know this area has DOD conflict and that's needs to be part of the discussion going forward. Next slide, please. So using the similar data from the North Coast, um, I don't have the area mapped out yet like we do on the North Coast, but the area of interest is directly north um, and a little to the east of the existing call area, which is right in the middle, sorry, uh, lease areas now that are right in the middle of that. So we know we have affected similar to the North Coast on the left panel. We have the Central Coast fisheries information, and we know what fisheries are occurring and overlap um, in there from that information that we have to work through issues on. And then on the, again, the no, same NOAA data on the right, uh, but adjusted for the Southern California fishing efforts um, show the level of fishing there uh, just north and east. So this is how we've been using the information to one, talk about what we can avoid and secondly, where the challenges are and what's occurring in the areas that um, work, work for offshore wind. Next slide, please. So the good news and the bad news is um, going out to our 2045 goal. So we are confident that we can meet our 2030 goals in the current leased areas. Of course, that depends on how um, the developers implement their projects and most of that area being viable once they start doing site assessment work. So the energy density, the how close we can get the turbines and how large the turbines are, are important. And those things are advancing and changing. 
uh, are important. So that's energy density. The more energy we can get out of a given area, the less area we need, obviously, to meet our goals. So in our current work at those areas I just showed you, five areas on the north coast and the one area on the south central coast, we um, have a total uh, looking at both high assumptions and low assumptions of energy density, we have identified between 30 gigawatts and 50 gigawatts of energy that can come out of those six areas. And that is in excess of the 20 that we would need to meet our 2045 goal. But it's still a high percentage of those areas. Um, if that is a goal for California beyond just planning, um, it is a high amount of energy. It would be two thirds of the areas um, if we have conservative estimates of energy production, pr production, but those are based on what we think we can get today. Industry has already said we're underestimating that of being too conservative. And so if we look at the industry's numbers, that would be more, more like 50 gigawatts and we would need uh, to consider half of those areas that I showed you on the map as being viable for development. So I'll leave, I think that that's the last slide, so I'll leave it there for questions. I know that's a lot to take in, so um, this, I just wanna reiterate, this is not the last chance to comment on this. This is the start of the conversation um, to talk through the implications of um, these goals for California and um, whether we should um, be considering uh, and what and considering all the factors of what it would look like if we work our way to a um, basically uh, support the industry offshore for its economic benefits. And I know that means economic trade-offs. I'll stop there. Thanks for that, Scott. Uh, appreciated. Um, Scott McMullen, you had your hand up and then put it down. Did you have something that? I was just going to ask about uh, consideration of areas outside 1300 meters, but uh, Scott already covered that uh, later on in the presentation. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, Jessica, please. Yeah, thanks, Scott, for this presentation. Um, I have two questions. My first is with regards to the workshops you mentioned, like that June 1st one on suitable sea space, is that open to the public or are those invitation only? No, those are public. The, the workshops, the four workshops are definitely public and we will have, uh, we're assembling, at least for the sea space one, we're assembling a panel of the folks that that we are consulting with the groups we're consulting with under 525 and then um, we're having public comment as part of those great thanks for that clarification and my second question was with regards to these fishing ground map products that are up here mm -hmm. now um, the ones on the left i believe you said represent past and present fishing grounds can you remind me of the source of those data or how those data sets were created for each one of those fisheries? Yeah, so these were, um, these are the, the uh, let me find the right name, I had it here. Um, these are data sets were made available on database and, but there's also more information on from the fishermen on, uh, and there's a website link to that in a storyboard, but these were uh, projects that were funded by the Ocean Protection Council to have the fishermen associations, both in Northern and Southern California get together and provide this and map and provide this information on fishing grounds. So the, the source are, are the local fishermen. I think as Steve Scheiblauer is on the line and he was one uh, instrumental in one of those associations for the central coast. And then we did, then they did a similar project on the North coast. And I can Great, I can so much, I can send you the links um, so you can get the metadata details. Great, thank you, Steve. I think you're up next. Yeah, thank you, uh, Scott. For, two questions. First, 
wouldn't the Energy Commission uh, workshop, which is scheduled for June 1st, wouldn't it be better informed if it occurred after the uh, outreach meetings with fishermen? And the second I, question, well, go ahead with that one first. I, I think, I mean, I'm not giving away any secrets to know that we've gotten behind our 525 schedule. So part of it is just um, deadline driven, but I think it could go either way. I think it could go either way, Steve, um, either getting some, I agree with you, but getting more information out ahead of time might give folks a little bit more time to prepare for those other more, more intimate meetings where we want to go through the details. So I could, okay. I could see it, I could see it either way. Oh, okay. Thank you, Scott. And my second question is in reference to the second to last slide where you show some, some banding, uh, different co colors of banding that indicate fisheries. And I, I find it rather puzzling and maybe you can ex explain it better, but I noticed that one of the bands mixes, it appears to mix uh, market squid with bluefin tuna. And that just seems kind of very, not, not, not correct. So can you uh, explain that the banding a little bit more? On which, um, sorry, on which map, Steve? The second to the last slide you had. For the, uh, but on the right or left? You know. On the left. Okay. Um, I think the, oh, I think the colors are just off that you're seeing. Those, um, um, if you could flip back to the last slide, please, that you just had. Um, the colors, I think the colors are just off speed. I had that problem myself. <laughs> There's only so many colors. Specifically, what's in that banded area um, on the left map, which is the fisherman's data, right? It should be just, it should be albacore, swordfish, um, bluefin tuna, thresher shark, and then the cod, sablefish, thorny head, and cob, sablefish. Um, canary and chili pepper rockfish. The, on my list, there's no, I think the color's just off. They don't think it makes a squid in there. Uh, but I am showing everything. So the bands closer to shore with all those multiple colors that are avoided by the area is everything. The, the list I just gave you is what's occurring inside that orange area. I think it's just the color. Uh, sorry about that. We could redo the colors to make it more clear. It was the caption for the color that got my attention because it it said the, blue fin see. tuna and and market squid. Oh, that's weird. I don't know why. I'll I'll check that. I'll check it, that. They shouldn't be mixed in there. So it could be just I uh, turned on a wrong layer. Okay, thank you. I'll check that. I'll check that. Michael. Yeah, thank you, Scott, for the presentation. Um, I attended two meetings, one in Crescent City, one in Eureka, uh, hosted by California Fish and Game for Wildlife. Uh, I thought they were pretty good meetings because they really focused on the audience and their concerns and the panels took a lot of questions and spent as much time as necessary uh, letting everybody say their piece and having some discourse in the process on what was going on. However, the majority of the meetings I've attended virtually and uh, in person have been spent 20, 30, 40 minutes talking about what the plans are for Bohm and others to uh, develop the coast and who they are and, and what's going on. I, I think the way CDF and W ran the meeting was a, a lot more of an advantage to the folks that attended. Plus, they, it seemed like there was, I mean, there were some hard knocks in the whole thing, but at least they got the information out on the table and the other meetings were just, you know, here we are and this is what we're going to do and we'll take comments, most of which was venting at that point. Um, so you might talk to your uh, 
other agency there and see what they did. It was, I can't remember exactly who it was once retired now um, that held those meetings uh, about a year and a half ago, I think. But those meetings themselves, the more you can uh, get the audience involved and, and speaking, and I'm talking specifically about fishermen and processors too, uh, I, the last thing you could do in that is you could vet some of these mapping you're doing right now with some of those uh, fishing communities. Uh, we mm -hmm. found some market differences in Oregon when we did that with one developer group over what the information they had. So thank you. Well, thank, thanks for that. Um, I, I participated in at least one of those meetings that you talked about um, and our intent I think that's why having the workshop first um, on June 1st, again, and plus these individual meetings, it, it has been a talking head sort of thing because people are seeing this for the first time. And then our challenge is new folks show up to the meetings and we want to catch them up on, on it. But I think we're ready after that workshop to really just dive straight in at those other in uh, those other webinars and in-person fishery meetings um, that come after in June. That's our intent for sure. Okay, I thought I recognized your name and now I know why. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Steve, John, or please. Thank you. Um, Scott, your uh, the slides up there now, it shows the distribution of these species. I guess that's the central coast. And then there is an earlier slide with the north coast. So I assume those are all adults of the species where they're caught as adults or uh, does that represent uh, more like uh, younger life stages, larvae, and so on? No, these would be where the adults are caught. But I, okay. so I did, I did catch your comments earlier on that, and so that's the kind of information that would be be useful. We we beat the bushes for years on for information, but um, haven't didn't re find anything readily available. So I, I'm definitely interested. Um, and if that's a huge data gap, that's something we want to identify in the strategic plan that we need to know more about. Yeah, I know Cal Coffee has a wealth of data going back years on their larval surveys. Uh, that might be a place okay. that, unless you've already looked. But um, you know, I can I can send you if you're interested. Uh, uh, many years ago, we had a sablefish symposium uh, in Seattle that. I dealt with uh, West Coast, Canada and Alaska, and and there are a couple of papers on distribution of the larval sablefish, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the nursery areas. For example, there's one off the Strait of Juan de Fuca that contributes uh, significantly to the uh, North Washington uh, sablefish fishery. So, um, but, you know, only about 20% of the coastwide sablefish are found in in Northern Washington. So obviously there are many other similar nursery areas uh, up and down the coast. And so those are the kinds of things that, you know, we think be just absolutely critical uh, to identify and to address. So, um, you know, if, if you want, I'll send that to you. And then uh, uh, your, I think the first map you showed of the entire coast, it, it didn't include the sanctuaries or other MPAs. And I just think it'd be helpful, you know, to get a, a the full picture of, of areas that, uh, you know, for example, where, where fishing is restricted or where off mm -hmm. wind development would not occur. Uh, so, if, you know, if you could just add those, uh, that, that would be good. Yes. Um, I don't know why I chose to show you the map that didn't have that on there, <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, and the point of showing that other one shows that the, it is, it does bifurcate the state into North and South where the accessible wind, wind resource is, and the better resource is on the North coast, but the load is on the South coast. So those are the other challenges we face uh, in working through this, um, the strategic plan and report to the legislature. But the, we definitely have that map and we'll, we'll bring it to the meetings. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, very interesting 
um, work you all are doing. I, I, you heard your conclusion that, and I'm probably not getting it correctly, fully correct, but th that you would need half to two thirds of the area, depending on the in intensity of energy output. But can you show mm -hmm. what that means? Like what areas are like, how big those, what that means in terms of, is there a, is there a map in this presentation? I might have missed where you were, what half to two thirds looks like. So, um, if it, yeah, I guess we could do that. I mean, I, I don't think I've laid it out that way, but you can, you could look at the first map if folks want to move back to that one of the North coast. So if it's all, I mean, if it's all on the North coast and we can't do any more in Southern California, um, then that means one thing. And I don't see the map moving on my end, but, um, it could be well, so it could be half of all five of those areas on the north coast. It could be the area, the biggest area with the most potential is um, off of Cre the big one off of Crescent City. It's also in shallower water, which aligns with um, what folks think are the are the current technology limits on deploying the technology at least that bohm is still considering um so that's ends it right at 1300 meters so that's that could provide quite a bit of it right there and then there are um it's hard to know exactly other areas of that are off of the mendocino cape mendocino so, and south of there are are bisected and impacted by shipping traffic too and so some of those will probably be precluded and go away so I, I, it's still up in the air a bit but um i definitely can prepare that sort of thing um that's probably a next a natural next step of what we're doing we're just quite haven't laid it out that way yet Thank you. Hey, Scott, I have a quick question for you. And I'm mm -hmm. assuming that Steve's and Mike's hands are both leftovers. Um, to what extent does the possibility of, of wind development in Southern Oregon, you know, we have the, currently we have call areas right on the border, California, Oregon, extending up. I don't know exactly how many miles, but it's not a, a small amount. Is that considered at all in in your sort of big picture look at the potential cumulative impacts? I think the um, so I ha do we do have that map too, and of course we're working with Bohm, who has the responsibility of the on the whole West Coast for looking at that. But that is an issue that uh, that's. Now that we know where these areas are, I think that's an issue that's come to the surface that we really need to seriously talk about. And we'd like that that's a focus of talking with the fishermen more too, now that we actually see that might happen. So yes, the what Mike's referring to is the this area. Now you're seeing it on the map um, on the screen. The map the area off of um, um, Crescent City, that large area that's north of the existing leases. Um, does butt right up against one of the Oregon call areas just over the border, and I'm not showing it on the map. And obviously, you see that underneath that, and I'm looking at the left panel, you, uh, underneath the, the information from the fishermen, you see the, the same NOAA ob observational data that's on the right panel. And so the fishing just continues right up, right up the coast. There's no, of course, no... <laughs> no respect of the state line for ecology, biology, and all of that. And so that has brought, I think that's one of the benefits of this exercise, Mike, is that brings those things clearly to light when you start drawing these things on the map and not talking about them in abstract. And that's a conversation we do need to have. I think even adding this many areas on the North Coast triggers that conversation just within California, but it also extends across the Oregon for sure. Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, Michael, is your is that a is that a leftover hand or a new hand? New hand. May I go right ahead? Of course. Uh, Steve, Mr. Joyner, uh touched on a really good subject, but I guess there's another side of that as far as data gaps go, and 
just knowing the life cycles themselves and these animals, I found out as I've studied it a little more and read papers, they can travel hundreds of miles up in, or down mm -hmm. the coast in the California current, uh, crab mega, megalopes being one of them uh, that land in Bodega Bay. And um, so that's all well and good understanding that, but I think the underlying thing that uh, makes all that possible is the physics of a meteorology and the hydrology that so impact the uh, ecosystem services themselves and the, phys the physics of that movement, that ocean transport that takes place through their life cycle. And there, I think, is a black hole as far as the effects that wind energy may have on that and that meteorology and the, the physics of that process which of course uh, effect, affects the uh, uh, ecosystem itself. So I, I guess that I would like to see, at least recognize that that's an area of study and a data gap that needs some, uh, some basic research on because there isn't much out there now and what there is isn't really organized in a way that's easy to find. So I'll leave it at that and uh, Thank you again. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Agree. Terry, should we? Um, is there anyone else from the the, the NPC that has a, a a question they want to raise raise now? Carrie, do we want to think about using our final seven minutes of the hour for uh, any public comments questions? Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. Um, can we start by if everyone who is thinking about wanting to make public comment today, which is right now scheduled for 1.30 p.m., could we just get a show of hands if you're planning to make public comment today and you're going to stick around um, until 1.30? And as those, mute yourself, please. Um, and as those hands come up, um, we can, if if there's some public comment that is specific to the California portion of this. Um, let's see who's unmuted. I I I just muted Steve again. He's got an echo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So if there's public comment that is specific to this California portion of our agenda today, uh, you know, we could take one or two of those before we break for lunch at noon. Um, I'm only seeing one hand up right now for public comment. And it is um, Steve. Steve, you didn't get enough <laughs> questions yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's not exactly a public comment because I'm a I'm a member, but I just wanted to add a couple of things to the California report, uh, and I won't go into detail about these, but just you know, for your information, uh, there was a California Coastal Commission briefing on offshore wind on May 11th. There was also a um, a fish California legislative uh, fisheries and aquaculture hearing just yesterday on also on offshore wind. And then, of course, we also have in California SB 286 and Assembly Bill uh, 80 that deal with offshore wind issues and what have you. So those things are kind of out there and I'd be happy to flesh those out a little bit more in the report that we that we give to the council. Sounds good. Well, um, Mike and Susan, I don't see any other um, hands up for public comment right now. So maybe we should um, take our lunch break, which is scheduled for just a half an hour, and then we'd come back at 1 p.m. But I guess maybe we should first turn to our um, presenters from California and see if there's anything else that you wanted to add before we say our thanks to you and break for lunch. So Jason or Scott or Danielle. Hi, this is Scott. Um, so thank you for uh, having us present today. And I we had a couple, couple of suggestions or offers for more information. Please send those to me. Um, I think I'm either on the email for this meeting or 
it's scott.flint at energy.ca.gov. And, um, and, you know, looking forward to the continued conversation at the upcoming meetings um, for those who can make it. And again, thank you. No, and thank you, Scott and Danielle and Holly and Jason for showing up. That great, greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Um, I know Mike has your contact information if there's anyone else on the MPC who has any follow ups or anything like that. So I guess with that, um, Susan and Mike, if it's okay with you, should we take our lunch break and reconvene at um, 1230? That sounds good to me. Okay, so we'll reconvene at 1230 and we'll go to Oregon updates. Uh, and I hope all you Oregonians are all ready to give us some Oregon updates, although <laughs> there might not be a whole lot given our current um, situation. So anyway, we'll break until 1230 PM. Thanks all. Thanks, Carrie.
the the whole idea of promoting offshore wind and getting some information as a as a backdrop on the ecology side uh, that doesn't seem to exist anywhere now. So um, I would say that the technical team is 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 gelling pretty well, and and I think we're progressing uh, very well uh, compared to when we came in the door. And Corey's been a big part of that, of course. So um, the one thing that <laughs> I listened to a, a meeting at the CEC and the, I think it was the National Nat Natural Resources Agency for California put on. It was an in-person meeting, but they, they led, allowed virtual participation or at least to listen in. But uh, somebody, I think it was Doug Bourne brought it up that Washington, uh, nothing was going on there, but he expected that something would be. And I, I found that a little bit interesting because I haven't heard anything to that effect. But And it was in a California audience entirely, except for myself. Um, and so who knows, maybe there is something brewing in the background, but at this stage of the game, Corey pretty well summed it up, and I don't have anything to add to that. I have a quick question, Susan, if that's all right. Yeah, um, Corey, you mentioned that um, Washington had hired a new offshore wind coordinator or something like that, but I didn't quite catch it. I thought boom, boom, I hear has hired, replaced. Ken Clark, who had left, they replaced him his position with someone name I. Um, they do not have. I think Heather Hall. Let me see if I can. They might have heard at the West Coast Ocean Alliance as well. Um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, I, can't, I don't know that. But yeah, we should. But they do have a Washington coordinator in place now, is is my understanding. Boom. Okay, good. Because my last conversation, um, if with Ingrid, actually, I don't know if Ingrid is still on. Ingrid, if you are, um, feel free to jump in. But I think it was still unfilled as of you know a week or two ago. I thought I had the mic. It's, it's uh, the WICMAC meeting is June fourteenth. Then it will be a hybrid first time meeting in person since the pandemic, um, but it will still be a, the uh, online option as well. Okay. Um, Ingrid is not in the meeting anymore. Uh, Heather, your hand is up. I'll bet you have some information on that bone position. Uh, Carrie, I don't own the bone position, but just wanted to highlight that Northwest Seaport Alliance, which is a combination of uh, Port of Seattle and Port of Tacoma, is holding a special meeting on May 24th from 9.30 to 1 on offshore wind. I put a link in the chat. The agenda is not posted yet, but there is a virtual um, a virtual way to watch it, and uh, they aren't not taking public comment at the special meeting, but they will take public comment at their regular meeting, which occurs sometime after the 24th. I don't remember the date. Um, so just wanted to alert that for people in Washington. Cool, thanks. And you said you put a chat or a link in the chat? I did, yeah. Great, okay. That is during our council meeting. So we'll see who can make it. No, May May twenty fourth, not June. Oh, okay. May twenty fourth, not during our council meeting. Next week. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other Washington updates before we turn to Steve Joner? Ah, thank you. Yeah. Um... Thanks, Heather, for mentioning that. I'd, I'm planning on going with Brian Blake, but uh, if you look at the participants, I don't think there's anybody that's real fishy in that group whatsoever. So it'll be interesting to be walking into the lion's den in a, in a sense. Uh, but uh, I do, I have heard rumblings from time to time about the development of Puget Sound for um, like the Port of Los Angeles is doing and uh, setting up for 
potentially manufacturing. I think that's a long shot. But uh, assembly of and shipping out of uh, wind turbines for use in the EEZ. So well, I don't know if they'll discuss that at all or not, but I suspect they will touch on it. Thank you, Mike. Okay, should we turn to Steve Joner? Okay. Um, I. I can't really do a written report because I haven't uh, been able to check with all the different tribal folks. So I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll speak it and then deny said it if anybody questions me. Uh, so, um, that's a joke, of course. Um, so I'll start with the uh, National Academy committee that I'm on. Um, we had a meeting in. Uh, well, our first one was uh, mid-April, which was a webinar. And um, some of you were on that, or there were over 400 people on that one. And uh, Liz Klein was uh, the introduction, introduced uh, the BOEM staff to us. And I, I brought up the question of uh, cumulative impacts with her. And as a result of that, that led in our next meeting of the, the uh, standing committee which was June 26th and 27th, and that was in person. And, and uh, I think there was a little bit of confusion with folks that were uh, signed on to that one, uh, that uh, you know they wanted to ask Bo uh, questions of Boehm. And, uh, and so after the first day, uh, you know, I think the, the the National Academy staff did a little better job of explaining this is this is actually a meeting of the National Academy Standing Committee, and not a Bohm meeting. And Bohm Bohm is there to uh, uh, give us reports and and to answer our questions. And so uh, I know that they were they were busy busy answering questions. And I know at least Mike got to come on once and ask a question. So the Kind of the format there is that the committee would meet, uh, have lunch for an hour and a half in closed session and talk about, you know, what things we wanted to see done. And then we'd have the open session with Boehm and anybody who signed on to it. And then each day we were supposed to have a, a follow up uh, with just the committee to discuss among ourselves uh, what we heard that day. and. I think both days uh, we ran over, so we weren't able to do that. But uh, just kind of a, a quick update on it. The the contract that the committee has with BOEM only goes through the end of this month. And so the the committee chairman and the uh, National Academy uh, person, I guess our coordinator, her name is Caroline Bell, uh, she and the chairman are are meeting today to talk about, you know, what they'd like to see in the new contract with Boehm, and uh, so they'll be they'll be working on that uh, in the near future, so that can be uh, just continued on. And I think the the conclusion is that both the team and Boehm that they want to continue the committee uh, and have uh, additional future meetings. So that will be decided in the near future. Uh, this is not official, but we did talk about at our next meeting uh, that the focus would be cumulative impacts. And because there was a lot of interest uh, in our first in-person meeting by folks from the West Coast, um, it's uh, likely that we will be meeting somewhere out here. Um, and then one thing that I, I, I won't say I learned, but I confirmed uh, in the conversation with Bohm when when I asked about enforcement and and follow up with once these operators are in place if they're doing something they shouldn't be or if they find they found out their problems, and well of course Bohm doesn't handle that Bessie does the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement I think is uh, what that stands for so uh they they uh explained to us 
how Boehm and Bessie came about. And so as I think as a result of that, I'll jump into yesterday, uh, the McCaw staff had a, a meeting with the Boehm staff. There were a lot of people on there, uh, including folks from Bessie. And uh, so Bessie, uh, they told us that they're going to become more involved. And that's something, you know, I told them, how can we do this with only half of the uh, the team responsible for offshore wind? And uh, so, you know, I asked specifically, what what happens if uh, once uh, an energy is an area is developed? And we see that there's problems. It's doing things it wasn't supposed to do, and there actually is a federal regulation that governs the uh, lease cancellation. And I don't know—is our folks familiar with that? It's uh, I, I tried to put it in the chat, and for some reason, um, I can't get anything when I try to try to uh, add something in the chat. Just gets a blank screen, so. I wanted to add that, but the reference is 30 CFR 585.437. 30 CFR 585.437. And I can I can email that out to Carrie if you want, unless folks are familiar with it. Um, so we had a, well, I don't know if we say productive, but at least we had an informative discussion with uh, Boehm and Bessie yesterday, and we're going to have to follow up on it. Uh, one thing we did uh, learn is that Boehm is planning to have a roundtable with tribes on, or Bessie is, not Boehm, Bessie is planning to have a roundtable with tribes on June 26th, uh, which is during our council meeting, uh, but I think it's all going to be a webinar. Um, so we'll we'll learn a little bit more about them and and how they're going to interact with us. And then I'm sure most of you know by now that the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians (ATNI) just recently uh, passed a resolution uh, sent to Boehm to ask them to uh, stop the stop the presses that uh, there are way too many questions that the tribes have and concerns the tribes have that need to be addressed. Uh, so I, I think you probably have received that, but um, it it was uh, kind of patterned after the the National Council of American Indians resolution that was done a couple months earlier. So uh, what what that tells me uh, there are a lot of tribes tribes that I really haven't had any contact with, and I haven't seen at any of our our uh, offshore wind related meetings are very concerned about this. Uh, on on the Co Oregon tribes, uh, uh, the Columbia River tribes, uh, tribes on the East Coast. So, um, one of the things I want to try to do is to communicate more with some of these other tribes, and I, I think one way to do that, <clears throat> at least on the West Coast, is with the West Coast Ocean Alliance. Uh, Pretty much all the tribes uh, on the West Coast are involved with that, not just the treaty tribes, the tribes that we see at Pacific Council. Uh, so um, they're having a, a wind summit for West Coast Ocean Alliance in August. So I'll probably, I, I, I think I attend one of their very first meetings. I haven't gone to any since then because I have plenty of opportunity to go to meetings and didn't want to add more. but. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, I think we're, we're continuing to pursue this question of cumulative impacts. And I guess I'm, I'm not accustomed to asking a question multiple times without really getting a response, but Hey, I'm stubborn enough. I'm not going away, nor are the tribes on this. So we'll keep after it. That's it.
think I already did. Can someone on the NPC confirm? I did. I can check if I didn't. Yes, thank you. Just wondering uh, if there's been much, if any, communication with the Central California tribes, the Chumash and the Selenian, among others. I have heard uh, some direct statements from them that they're expressing concerns about offshore wind in that area. Just w wondering if there's any any real dialogue going on with them. Yeah, Steve, uh, Steve I uh, haven't personally, but our, our tribal council has been, and, and that's why... Uh, Actually, Joe Schumacher from Quinault, uh, he, he's more active with the West Coast Ocean Alliance, and he said, I really need to engage with them, and that's where I can I can interact directly with, with some of these other tribes. So that's one of the things, uh, you know, in the next couple of days I want to follow up on. And what one thing I forgot uh, in my report, I knew there was one thing I was missing. And so uh, there were two folks from... Uh, the environmental division of uh, environmental program from uh, Boehm back in the DC area. Uh, uh, Rodney Rodney Cluck and Jill Lewand Lewandowski, I think her name was, they both talked about uh, things they've done to prepare for offshore wind surveys and so on. And you know, it was obvious that there's been a lot of work done uh, getting a baseline for what's there before uh, anything goes in the water, in the Alaska waters because of the long history of, of drilling, oil drilling, and also in the Gulf, but very lacking out here. And I was kind of puzzled because I thought, I'm not aware of all that. And it, uh, I, I think that what was shown to us by California this morning is what we're looking for from Boehm. So I invited... Uh, one of those two, I said, either or both of you should come out to our Pacific Council meeting, and we'd really like to sit down with you and 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 talk to you in person about this. And so uh, Rodney got back to me and said, thanks for the invitation, but there will be folks there from the Pacific region that will be available. So I, I talked to Susan about this, and, you know, I, I really think that if anybody comes to the, the June meeting from Boehm, you know, we need to have more than just their little presentation, the council answer questions and leave. I'd like to have them sit down and really get into this. And that's a point I made to Boehm yesterday in our, our tribal staff meeting with them is that, you know, I, I feel like we're just not getting it done by these uh, webinar type meetings. We need to sit down in person and really start addressing these these concerns. So hopefully, Carrie, uh, you can find out who's going to be there and uh, you can lock the doors, uh, uh, the exit until they agree to sit down with us. Well, fire codes aside, um, I like that uh, idea of sitting down for a heart to heart. I did talk to um, Doug Bourne about that. Uh, specifically about the June council meeting. This is on the afternoon. This is on the agenda for the afternoon of Saturday, June 24th. Um, and he he wasn't sure yet if he or anyone would be there in person because because of the fact that the Oregon WIAs are up in the air. You know, I think they're sort of regrouping. So, yeah, they're um, generally pretty responsive and. Um, you know, come to meet with us when invited. Although, like you said, Steve, it's almost always virtual. Um, so, yeah. But, you know, this is in the notes. And, um, you know, when I circle back with him before too long, um, I'll let him know that it would be, I, I think that it would be helpful to have him or some senior BOEM staff present. Hopefully they will. Yeah, um, Susan, thank you, Steve, for sitting on that uh, National Academies panel. But I, I think one thing maybe people don't realize is Steve's been doing a lot of work 
to get the word out and talking with other people so that these letters that come forward like they did with the the group, the affiliated group, uh, he's bet, had a big role in that and, and uh, kind of gets lost, but he's been everywhere there is to be and talking to people and uh, keeps beating a drum on this one. So, so I'd like to thank him for that because um, without him, we might be in a totally different situation with the tribes and we need their support. So, or at least those of us that sort of have misgivings. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is, though, in the National Academies on the, I think it was on the first meeting, maybe not. Well, I guess it's, I can't remember for sure, but um, I got a little bit snarly and uh, asked them why we didn't have West Coast participation for our own fisheries and why Steve had to carry the the load for both the non-tribal and the tribal. And of course he's he's obligated to consider tribal first, but he's been kind enough to uh, deliver quite a bit of information on the West Coast fisheries themselves and how important it is. But otherwise that information wouldn't be out there at all. And I ask why we don't have a representative. I got a real snarky answer the first time uh, that it's just, you, you just don't understand our process or something like that. We'll, we'll do it as we see fit or the scientists tell us what to do. And But the second time, second meeting, when I went back and I basically asked the same question again, they said there were three people still to be put on that panel and that they were looking at a, this doesn't mean they'll do it, but a West Coast, Coast person um, from the fisheries itself. And then not just have Steve have to carry the whole load. So we'll see if that happens. But um, Steve's had to overrun a bunch of bias in just getting as far as we have on discussing the uh, asking the right questions about offshore wind. So um, otherwise, it would be a totally different story. All right. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks, Susan. Um, Mike, Mike is right. There are are three more spots, and um, I uh, I didn't want to start jumping up and down because uh, nobody was really promoting anybody at that point. But um, let's just say that uh, they know who you are, <laughs> the, the, you know, the West Coast folks, and uh, I I will. Certainly at our next meeting, uh, promote somebody and uh, I don't know who, you know, if we can come up with a name who, who would be a good nominee. Uh, I know Mike would certainly be willing to do it, um, but, and um, I appreciate everything Mike does to, to help me, but I, I don't know if it's appropriate for us to do that, but if we can just uh, informally kind of agree on one or two names, then I can I can promote those while we're in the committee meeting. We didn't have that level of discussion detail. I think the first uh, order of business was to get a, a longer term contract with Boehm. And, and then and and then start moving on to 
more uh, on other things. But I, once uh, Caroline Bell gets back to me, I emailed her this morning to ask her where, what the status was, and uh, she said she would keep me posted on their on their discussion with Boehm. And once once we know that, then I'll I'll ask her, you know, what what it looks like for adding additional folks, but. Again, I'll, I'll say they certainly saw the interest from the West Coast. Okay. Yeah, I think that seems reasonable and I, I I think where you're going with this is maybe providing names via the council process, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair enough. And uh, Tim Sipple put a note in the chat. He also um, put his name in, and I think maybe Karen Braby did as well. I'm not sure, but yeah, there was a lot of interest. So, yeah, let's um, put this uh, as a as a placeholder for June 6 for discussion. Yeah, I. I did not put my name in, and I think that the people that did show interest should be at the head of a list. Um, personally, any of the three that you just mentioned, uh, Dan, uh, maybe I know he's busy, but he may not be as busy as Mike Conroy is. Uh, Mike would be great, and of course, uh, Karen would be great too. But you know, she's in a brand new job, and I don't know how much she would appreciate her going off on this one. Since technically right now, they, at least at this point, are not um, looking at offshore wind as, uh, I appreciate it, Steve, but I think that getting one of those three on there would be the, the right thing to do. I'm, I'm in total agreement with that. I could highly recommend any, any of the three. But I, I don't want to be in the position to <laughs> choose the the top. So I I'd really, uh, again I don't know. We haven't really just they haven't talked about the process and how we'd go about it. But I I really think it'd be helpful if you know this is the person that is uh, recommended by the folks from the West Coast would go a long way toward that. Yes, indeed. Oh, did another hand just go up? Oh, Heather's here for public comment. Yeah, if anyone wants to make public comment, those of you who are not on the MPC, uh, raise your hand and um, we'll get a head count and then we can take public comment. So Heather, why don't you go ahead? 
Uh, thanks, Carrie. Thanks, um, uh, committee members. Uh, I did want to give a little bit of public comment uh, for the record. Heather Mann, Midwater Trawlers Cooperative, also um, uh, leader uh, of the Protect U.S. Fishermen uh, Coalition. Um, I wanted to thank Steve Joner uh, for all the work that he's done, in particular with the um, various tribes. I think that um, that's really, really important and helpful. And I uh, want to echo what Mike said. Um, Steve, it's really been, the work you've done is really fantastic. Um, it's my understanding that there is a letter coming from Oregon tribes at some point that's being drafted right now. Um, and as soon as I see that or get my hands on it, I'll certainly share it. Um, I, For my public comment, I just wanted to actually do a little bit of updating for um, some of the things that I've been up to to share with folks. Um, I've met with Liz Klein uh, virtually. I was joined by Lori from the Processors Association, Nick Edwards um, and Lee Habiger from Seafood Harvesters. Uh, two things I wanted to point out there. I had asked for an hour long Zoom meeting. They gave us uh, 15 minutes and then I said we needed more time. And the person at Boehm said, well, you'll have to prove to me that you deserve that much time which I thought was pretty rude uh, and kind of made me think about what, how that meeting might go. They ended up giving us 45 minutes. It was very unsatisfactory meeting. A lot of the same normal boom talking points, very little um, transparency into the process, uh, but clearly developers are getting a priority when we discussed putting um, at least mapping or looking at uh, water deeper than 1300 meters, you know, Liz was very adamant that, um, well, developers can't operate out there. And we said, well, that's not necessarily true. We have heard from some companies that say it is feasible. It's just not as profitable as they would like. Um, it, 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 we came out of that meeting with a commitment to talk again, but honestly, it's, um, I'm not sure it's worth anything because I think, Boehm is just checking a box saying that they're they're having these meetings, but there was no authentic engagement. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. last week. I brought two commercial fishermen with me. Um, uh, our final meeting of the week was with White House level advisors. Um, I've met with these advisors three times now, um, and I think that we are making some progress there in terms of uh, sharing the frustration that we have um, and not being heard by Bohm. Um, and I think it's actually starting to resonate with uh, folks at the White House and CEQ. Um, so we had good meetings there. And then we just met with legislators from uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, there is some discussion right now about a follow up congressional letter. Um, to Bohm, hopefully bicameral, bipartisan for Washington and Oregon. Um, and it'll be around something along the lines of, we uh, recommend no lease sales occur until X, Y, and Z happens. And X, Y, and Z is still being discussed. And then finally, um, also met with uh, Congressman Van Drew uh, in New Jersey, been working a lot with that office and also just with our partners on the East Coast on national level um, offshore wind issues. And uh, they are looking at some legislation, uh, federal legislation based on the synthesis of the science report that came out, which was a collaboration between Rhoda, uh, NIMFS, and Bohm on some of the gaps or a lot of the gaps that exist out there. Um, so stay tuned for something there. Um, I said finally, but one more finally, and that is that there may be some federal hearings um, with the uh, WWF committee uh, majority sometime in June on, particularly on offshore wind. Um, you know, there have been some field hearings and whatnot that Van Drew has done, but um, the Natural Resources Committee, uh, subcommittee on water, wildlife, and fisheries, um, they were, we met with that staff uh, from that committee and they're talking about as well having some potential hearings over the next month or so. 
So just wanted to share all those things um, with folks and happy to answer any questions people have. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, thanks for the update, Heather. Any questions for Heather? Any other public comment? None. All right, then I guess we can conclude public comment and um, move on to our last item, which is further discussion as needed um, and basically wrap up. Um, so <laughs> this is where uh, the hand just went up, didn't it? Let's see. Yeah, yeah sorry. I was, I was trying to get it up sooner. Uh, and I just want to tell Heather, I know you, you're you spending a lot of energy on this and I get multiple emails from you uh, per day, I think. And uh, I really appreciate that because uh, it's great to have somebody that's tracking all this down. And uh, so I don't have to spend all that time doing it myself and then I can take what you sent and and work with it. So anyway, I appreciate that very much, Heather. Thanks. Thanks. Takes a village. Takes a team. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Then um, we can move on. Um, this is where we were going to start talking about um, the June 6th meeting in context of um, getting ready to put together comments and responses to the Oregon draft WIAs, but um, we know that that's not going to happen now. So just to sort of follow up on that, we mentioned this at the beginning, we will still have that meeting on June 6th. Um, we, uh, one of the developers from RWE has herded some of the cats uh, with the other four um, offshore wind lease holders down there. And they're going to talk to us about um, fishery communications plans, which is a good thing because they are required to go out for um, public review and comment. Um, and we have, you know, the council and the council family has been very interested in participating, making sure that, um, you know, the needs of the fishing communities um, are met um, in these communications plans. So, the agenda is still fairly embryonic, but um, that will be a key part of it. And I've also heard a couple of other things that um, we'll want to put on that agenda. One is uh, uh, continuing the discussion on the National Academy Standing Committee and those three remaining slots. I think there was some good discussion. And, um, you know, realizing that, like, this is a nationwide, you know, or na of national scope. So, you know, it seems, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of us, but, it, you know, obviously we want the Pacific Coast uh, well represented, first and foremost, and um, we know that there are some really strong candidates that we're already in. And so, you know, I don't know if you guys are going to want to, I, I doubt that you will want to put forward a specific name. You might want to, but, um, but I think it would make sense to, um, you know, have the council, um, you know, make some sort of comment um, or recommendation on, you know, making sure the Pacific Coast interests are, are adequately represented. Um, as someone said, Steve is kind of wearing both hats now, both the tribal hat and the Pacific Coast. So anyway, I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself, but let, let's tee that up for discussion on June 6th. And then um, I, uh, I have John Hansen with the West Coast Oceans Alliance on my list of people to catch up with. So I'll see if he could, um, join us and give an update on what's coming down the pike. I know that they have this um, offshore wind summit um, scheduled. Uh, I think it's firmly scheduled, although I mean, I don't know. I don't know any details, but I think it's very late August. Um, so anyway, I'll reach out to John and see if he can join us and give us an update. Um, are there any other issues that you guys can think of right now that we would want to put on that June 6th agenda. <laughs> right. Okay, well, ah, there's a hand. It's Steve's hand. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, my hand keeps going up. Uh, the dates 
the dates I have are for the West Coast Ocean Alliance uh, Wind Summit is uh, August 22 through 24. Ah, okay. I thought it was even later than that. That's good to know. Is that it, Steve? Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, if uh, anyone on the MC has other uh, agenda item suggestions, please send them to Susan, Mike, Conroy, or me. Um, and before too long, uh, we'll start putting together the agenda for June 6th. Um, yeah. Um, sometime back, I think it was 2 years ago. I can't remember, but I, I might probably have a copy of it somewhere. I know I commented on it, but they had a, um, a, not an outline. I think it was about a 70 page paper on what engagement meant for Oregon. And I don't know why they didn't put all 3 states on there, but they being Boehm in this case, um. Actually, some of the ideas that they have in there, I thought were pretty darn good. Uh, that said, I don't think they followed any of them very well, uh, if at all. And that might be a reference document if you're, you know, wanting to to take a look at what they said they were supposed to do. Of course, this is all guidelines, right? It's not rules, and so. It, it, I guess I don't even know if it goes to be in a protocol, but uh, they that information's out there, and if we we are going to look at uh, engagement, I think you might start with that from that point, and if there's additional thoughts that go with it, then you know at least you'd have a base. But there's I'd say probably ten points in there at least that they haven't followed it to the least. So uh, that were, I thought, pretty good points. They just never did them. Well, it's always if you if you can then take information that they put out on, for consideration, and then kind of say, well, why didn't you? Kind of thing. It's it's a little I think a little more power to it than just coming up with brand new stuff that they can float away from. So, what you're really skilled at doing. Hey, um, yeah, so if the developers are going to be there to talk about the engagement plans, I'm also wondering if they could talk about their um, upcoming surveys and like when they think they might be starting those and um, what they're thinking in particular for fish surveys. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. I envision sort of a conversation with them and maybe we can provide some, you know, key topics that we'll want them to talk about. Okay. Um, Susan, before we wrap up, I, I don't know if there's anything else people want to talk about, but I do want to just confirm our schedule for the next um, for getting this initial report in the advanced briefing book, which is a tight turnaround. Okay, it's a tight turnaround, folks. And um, we talked about this at the beginning, but um, when Mike and I, because Susan was still on vacation last week, um, when we discussed this uh, and looked to our briefing book deadline for the June meeting, we um, we decided that what we really need to have is um, draft sections from each of the states uh, and Steve Joner, a write up um, on the tribal issue, please also um, send to me and Mike and Susan by COB Monday. We'll do a quick turnaround, put it together uh, into a single draft report, send it back to the MPC for review and you guys will have until 8 a.m. Wednesday. Mike Conroy appreciates that because he often works until one or two or three in the morning. So, um, so comments on that draft will be due Wednesday morning. Um, and so we ask that the, that the people that we identified before this meeting to provide the reports, you know, who you are from California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and then Steve, you get Steve Joner, you get double duty. Um, please work with each other over, you know, the next few days um, and get us some, um, you know, get us your uh, write-ups uh, by Monday COB. Now, um, you guys are pretty familiar with what these look like. We we don't want long, drawn-out, you know, Leo Tolstoy um, type of reports. We are we are reporting to the council, and so you know they they appreciate having this in the advanced briefing book. It gives them a little bit of time to read and digest. But at the same time, as you guys know, the council members have an enormous amount of um, information to understand and, and consider that's in the briefing book. Council members and advisory body members, you guys all have an awful lot to, um, to you know, sort of digest and consider. Um, so think about uh, being fairly succinct yet informative. You know, you can provide links where you need to so, um, so that if people want to learn more about specific topic or whatever, then uh, you can point them towards those links. Um, and typically, you know, for for this kind of magnitude of a meeting, I think our reports are usually in the like, you know, three, four, six page range. Um, anything longer than that gets gets a bit much. Um, but anyway, you know, use your own judgment, but just be succinct and um, and we'll see what we can do. Um, and then you all have a link to the Google Doc where there's about eight or nine pages of notes. Thanks for Lila and Susan and whoever else has been taking notes so you can refer to those. This meeting is being recorded. I missed about the first 20 or 25 minutes after lunch. I apologize. I was in a post-lunch stupor and um, didn't start it. So we so um what was not recorded was most of the um california presentations i apologize for that but we do have um the notes um there's pretty pretty thorough notes and also um just to let you know when they sent those slides to me um and when we we've been you know conversing by email i asked if we can post those and share them and they said no not yet um obviously you know they know that what they showed on the screen is basically putting it out there in the public, but they didn't want us to post the slides. That said, um, you know, I, I think before too long, they um, they would probably be willing to make those available. I know there's some public meetings coming up, um, which would you know also be probably a you know a touch point to make those publicly available. So. Anyway, that's where we're going from here. Use the notes, use your own notes. Oh, I also, I've copied all the um, links from the chat. And so I'll post those into the notes on the Google Doc. 
Um, and if anyone has trouble accessing the Google Doc, give me a shout and I'll just send you a Word document. Um, but that's the plan. So any questions or concerns or issues about um, about um, the plan to get this uh, this MPC report into the briefing book? Do a document separately. I don't know if that would be easier, but just several other options so that we can all stay in touch with what's going on. Yeah, good point. We did record this and also did the transcription for this meeting, which I haven't done in the past, but uh, that's a helpful tool also. And I appreciate that, Carrie. I know transcripts from meetings like this sometimes don't always accurately capture, you know, when we use some acronyms or vernacular specific to our discussions you know you may have to try to figure out what they what they wrote and how it applies but i think we can figure that out okay well there's a lot of information that we can share um, especially in california there's a lot of upcoming meetings and um you know activities so we'll want to make sure we convey that um you know efficiently to the to the council so thanks in advance for everyone putting those together Gary, yeah. um, one of the things I've continually asked Boehm is, have you replied to the Pacific Council on their letters yet? And uh, all I get is we're working on it. Have they replied to anything yet? Um, no, oh, not as far as the recent letters, you know, from the last couple months. Right. Yeah. No, when I talked to Doug the other day, he, he said, he said, we're, we're working on it. Like he told you, he said, we're working on, you know, um, you know, how to, he didn't say so much a reply, because I don't think we specifically asked for a reply or response. Um, but I think he did acknowledge that, you know, that, you know, that it would be, the council would like to have a response and it would be helpful. Um, so for what it's worth, no, he hasn't, there hasn't been a response yet, but um, I think they are figuring out how they want to respond. Nothing new there. <laughs> Nothing new. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Corey Niles, I think you have um, a great suggestion and we should probably just, you know, engage chat GPT from the beginning and then it will just write our report for us. Oh, good idea. Exactly. <laughs> Little levity, good. Um, all right. Well, so we need to work Snooky into our uh, into our MPC report per Corey's suggestion. Um, for those of you who don't know, there was an article, a recent article in Politico, about uh, some East Coast uh, impediments to offshore wind and how that's shaping up. And uh, Snooky was one of the people who said, you know, who had problems with offshore wind off the coast of New Jersey. So I'm thinking, you know, Reality Stars getting involved in offshore wind might be an interesting quirk. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the wheels are turning here. Yep. Nookie. That's a name I didn't need to hear, but thanks anyway, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. All right, um, any last words from the NPC members? Or anyone else? We're wrapping up a little early. All righty then. Well, please uh, get us your sections by Monday COB and we'll turn it around for a quick review. And I just wanna thank everyone, Susan and Mike Conroy and Lila and um, all of our uh, California State Agency reps who came and presented to us um, and all the um, MPC members for participating. We really appreciate it. This is an awful lot going on. 
uh, at, it's a heavy lift and um, there's no end in sight. So we appreciate all your efforts um, and we welcome our newest member, Jessica Watson. Thanks for jumping right into the deep end of the pool. And thanks again for Delia. Glad to know that you're gonna still be around and available as a resource. You've been great so far, so we appreciate it. And Susan, you wanna close the meeting here? Sure, just wanna say echo Carrie's thanks to everyone. And um, let us know, me, Mike, and Carrie, if you have any questions or further comments. If you think of something between now and June, let us know. And otherwise we will see you all back here on June 6th with a focus on California. Okay, hey, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks everybody.